Hello and welcome to a Sunday night edition of the Managing Madrid podcast. I'm your host, Kian Sobani, and I'm joined tonight by Matt Wiltsey. And we're recording this about an hour or so, an hour and change after the Real Madrid thump Villarreal 4 1 in what was a roller coaster of emotions. The yin and the yang, the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys of being a Madridista this season. On one hand, Matt, we got some amazing stuff happen. We had a Brahim Diaz Golasso. Another Jude Bellingham masterclass. Just schedule that one in. Schedule tweets. Schedule comment. Every single post game show, we we got to pencil that one in. Rodrigo continues to be great. Uh, takes a very well earned goal. Luka Modric, best performance of the season from him. He looked fantastic. Lucas Vasquez on the right wing, dominating two way performance. Fede Valverde was great. Tony Cruz was great. It was a very good performance, and yet. Can't help but feel just a little bit down the whole night because in unspeakable fashion, just like Carlo Ancelotti said after the game, it's the first time he's ever had to endure three ACL injuries in one season. The devastating news that David Alaba, who left uh, quite a horrific injury, like when we saw it in real time, we're like, that can't be good. The knee kind of buckled. He couldn't get up. He couldn't walk off the field on his own. And... uh very rarely does Real Madrid put out an official medical report after the game. Usually it's, okay, we'll do tests tomorrow and all this, but we we already know he's going to get surgery, and it's an ACL tear. And I don't know what else to say. It's just this season has been a nightmare. It's, it's a miracle we are in the position we are, playing as good as we are with half of our team absolutely decimated. So on that note, Matt, I have so much to talk to you about. Welcome to the show, man. How are you? Hey, Kian. Yeah, I'm good. I think, like you said, so many talking points from this game. Uh, but first and foremost, I think this is the best match of the season. It was so fun to watch. Um, I think you saw so many things go right, so many fantastic individual performances like you named. But even just the tactical setup from Carlo, the way the team pressed today, which he highlighted quite a bit in, in his post-match comments, um the goals everything like the energy from the team and the stadium and um i loved it i I thought it was such a fun game and it was it was great stuff like it i've thoroughly i said this after the game i tweeted this out i've thoroughly enjoyed this first half of the season like carlo season three we've never seen it before so far i've loved it like i think given the context of everything that's happened like those injuries i think it's just been an incredible ride we've been playing really well and we continue to see the tactical tweaks and shape shifting when personnel goes out and uh some of the changes carlos made over the season and i just think it's it's all going really well season four could be loading matt um according to all uh reliable reports including lucas navarrete on managing madrid club sources say that he is very close to renewing with the team for another season so we'll bring that forward I have the same observations as you. I think, and I and I tweeted it too. I've actually enjoyed watching Real Madrid play this season. Like, I don't always say that about watching Real Madrid play. I sometimes have to just watch it and I do it as a job. But there are times, and you and I have done many post game podcasts. Remember in that that one nil era phase under like that yep. that Zidane title race. I was like, okay, we're winning. Yep. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not as eventful as it is right now, be it for good or bad. But in this particular case, it's been really good. It's been fun to watch. Now you can talk about Jude Bellingham and how incredible he's been. And I I went through it today because I'm writing about him in my next column. He's posting career highs in virtually every single metric. And so you're taking a player who has exceeded expectations, now looks like we completely underpaid for him, and he's improved, and a lot of like you can say, oh well, of course he's improved his his metrics and all of his stats because he's playing for Real Madrid. He's more of a focal point. Do you know how many players would fold under that pressure? How many great, how many good players we've signed at other clubs, and they just cannot replicate it at a bigger club like Real Madrid is a different beast. So he's been unbelievable. But I I really went I went back to this. I thought like you know the I think. Ancelotti has a huge, huge hand in why I've enjoyed, why we've enjoyed watching this team 
play like this this season. I mean, the team has been decimated with injuries, just nonstop. As soon as we got one back, we lose two. Like, that's how what it feels like. And it's like Russian roulette every day. You wake up like, oh, shit, who's injured today? Who tore their ACL today? I mean, like, I can't believe that. I mean, it's surreal. David Alaba tore his ACL tonight. What? How did this happen for the third time this season? This is crazy. Our two starting center backs heading into the season, plus our goalkeeper. And, oh, man, I like, look, we all know. I Broken record. The team is decimated. We're a top of the league. We had a flawless Champions League campaign so far in the group stages. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I think I may have mentioned this to you, Matt, but Diego was complaining like, oh, man, you know, we, Barca, we're getting screwed, man. Like, and that's the thing. Like, we have so many injuries. And it's like people forget that Real Madrid have injuries because we're playing so well. Like, that's a huge difference between Real Madrid and Barcelona right now. It's like Real Madrid have, like, gone through this injury crisis somehow unscathed in the results department. So yeah, it's unbelievable. I don't know. I, I, yeah, go ahead. Jump in. Yeah. I was just going to say on that injury. Um, I think back, remember 2021 when Liverpool had all those injuries and they basically fell apart and like all their fans, like everybody just rid it off. They're like, Oh, just an injury season. Like, what are you going to do? And they wrote the season off like real Madrid arguably have worse injuries right now than, than that Liverpool team did. And yeah, we're still competing on on all fronts. We'll see, we'll see how how we're able to last into the spring. But still, I think, it, again, it, like what you just said, people forget people forget the injuries we had. That our starting world class best goalkeeper in the world, Thibaut Courtois, Militao, like arguably one of the best center backs in the world. Um, so many to just continue rattling through them, and I think. I sometimes feel like if Carlo was 20 years young or 30 years younger and like an up and coming manager and doing what he was doing now, then everybody would be like, Oh my God, we need to get the renewal immediately. Like we have to sign, we have to lock this guy down, but just because he's been around the block for however many years, um, nobody wants to, people aren't excited to renew. And maybe this is just my viewpoint from looking at football to Twitter, but I think like, I think but I, if I, me as a longtime Madrid fan watching this team, like you and I both know how many times it doesn't really always work out when a great manager comes in. But like no. sometimes it just doesn't work out at Real Madrid for whatever reason. Yeah. You have a guy like Carlo who is second or best <laughs> man, second or third best manager in our entire history. And we've got the best quad squad chemistry going that we've ever had. He's developed all of these young players, like think about where we were from when he took over to where we are now, even guys like Fede Valverde continue to, to develop um, their roles continue to improve. Like, I just think you go through the checkbox and like, there's very little you can point out that Ancelotti isn't doing well right now. And obviously bumps will come. We're, we're praising him right now. Bumps will come. We know that, especially it's usually January, February. So we know the dips will come, but I think, I just think when you zoom out, it's just been um, – I don't think this guy's getting enough credit, and I, I, I don't know why most Mad- Madridistas wouldn't be really happy about the potential of him signing a renewal. Uh, so just as an aside, because you mentioned maybe you're looking at football Twitter too much. I don't, I don't know what you said, but uh, I just have like a, a quick aside, 15-second rant. I don't know. Twitter needs to just get its shit together. Like the whole platform, like it's, it's great in so many ways because I've never had, like, we've never had so much reach. Like I'll tweet something and it's just like tens of thousands of people within like two minutes. I'm like, wow, okay, this is great. I have a a platform here. I can like, I'm very grateful for that. On the other hand, I don't really know what's going on. Like there's, I, I finally figured out that I'm really late on this, but the reason I stopped checking it is because it was just, it just shows you a bunch of stuff from people you don't follow. And I'm like, okay, I follow people for a reason. So I go to the, if if you go to the for you tab, it's like a different planet. I don't even know what the, I don't understand what I'm looking at. There's all this stuff that's like viral has nothing to do with football. Something about like history, something about like weird things, something like some memes. Okay. The memes are at least a little bit cool, but like, then I'm go and then I go to the following tab. I'm just like, ah, oh, yeah. It's like, it's like uh, jumping in like a nice ice cool 
bath after being roasted in the desert for like two hours. Like, oh, this is nice. But then it just keeps switching to the the default is the the for you tab. Elon, get rid of the for you tab. We follow people for a reason. We just want to see the the people we follow. That's it. All right. Rant aside. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know what the hell we were talking about. Uh, Ancelotti. What do you think about my comment on Ancelotti if he was 30 years younger? I think it's probably true. But I, uh, I also want to add to that, like, because you, you keep on mentioning we've never seen year three of Carlo. I, I think it actually gets better before it gets worse with Carlo with the fourth year. That's my prediction because the squad only gets better. It doesn't get worse for a fourth year, I assume. Um, Because we got people coming, at least in the summertime, new people. At the very least, we know Hendrick's coming. That's one and probably one or two more. So I think because the squad will get better and you assume that health will get better, I only see the fourth year going better too of course that a very simplified view it doesn't always work the way you think it is so i'm i'm gonna put that disclaimer out there but why would it get worse we always said Ancelotti's type of coach like the more stars he has the more he gets to shine in terms of managing the egos and managing the locker room right that's why he's more successful at a team like us than at a team like everton for example um i do think we should talk about the whole Alaba thing. First and foremost, I forgot to comp- I completely forgot to mention that the most important thing is that Alaba recovers and gets through this as swiftly and fast and efficient and as healthy as possible. And we're thinking about you, David Alaba. We know you're a long term, long time listener of the podcast, and we hope that you recover well and we wish you well. I know it's not easy what you're going through. I can't imagine. On that note, uh. There are real murmurings now about signing someone in the winter, Matt. Before we jump into some of the details of the game, I, you know, you know, it's DEFCON one when Ancelotti says in the post game presser, "I think we're gonna sign. I think we're gonna look into it." <laughs> like he didn't say like, "Oh, the squad is great. We can put Chum." Actually, he did say Chum, and he can play center back in the post game press conference. But I think they're gonna look at someone. So I wanted to ask you, like, what do you think is a realistic? Um, approach here. Yeah, this is a tough one because obviously your hands are a little bit tied if you go as you go into the market because everybody knows you want a center back in your Real Madrid, and so it's only going to inflate the price further. Um, yeah. I've seen obviously people throw out um like loan options, like a guy like Pepe or um. I don't know, like kind of that older center back to bring in just to kind of do a patch job. But I don't know. I feel like whenever we make those types of signings, it doesn't really work out. It doesn't make sense. And I think our trajectory trajectory really has been identifying those young guys with potential. Um, so I think they're going to go that route. I think I wouldn't be surprised. I've already seen this. I wouldn't be surprised if it's just Rafa Marine returns from Alaves. Nacho Rudiger, obviously the starters. I think Chuameni would probably be the third. And then Rafa Marine, fourth center back, kind of super in case of emergency. So that's what I think is going to happen. So Sam Leverage pointed this out on Twitter. Uh, and this was kind of my concern too that. So Rudiger, forget about resting Rudiger ever, essentially. He's played the most minutes of anyone on the team this season. And I looked it up a couple of weeks ago. He's pretty much now almost number one in all of Europe in the big five leagues. He also plays He's playing every minute games. with Germany. Yeah. And now he, you just can't rest him because you can't go like too many. And, you know, God, God forbid if it goes any further than this, you know, <laughs> Rudiger and Nacho are going to be starting every game for a while. Luckily, yeah. we do, I think, have a couple of weeks off for Christmas, right? Is it? Yeah. I don't know if it's quite two weeks, but it's at least something. I th- so that's that was the concern I've had for a while. Like when Militao went down, my concern was not in the ability of Rudiger, Nacho, and Alaba. My concern was, okay, do they get run into the ground? You know, if you lose one, one or two of them will have to play a lot more, and then they get run down, and and God forbid they get injured. Uh. 
I just looking at kind of the realistic things and and you 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 made that point about it's hard to find that guy, that older guy, like the patch, the band-aid guy. Can you find the Adabayor of the back line? The the Edgar Davids, like when he went to Barca midway through the season and completely lifted them. That kind of like veteran. I feel like I mean, Pepe feels like a, a pipe dream, man. I mean, I would love yeah, to bring Pepe in for six just... months, but I just it seems so unrealistic that he would yeah. leave us a Porto right now mid mid season yeah. to come here. Be great though. I would I would sign up right now. I would sign it. Yes, bring him, bring him for six months. I, but I don't think he would sign up for that. But the veteran presence, experienced guy, I think is more ideal. I'm looking at Rafa Marin, like at Alaves. You know, you you wanted to bring him back. Of course, the other option is like someone like Marvel from Castilla, but Rafa Marin is like okay. I don't know. Like, this is a serious question. If we played, uh, you know, a Champions League game tomorrow, knockout game, would and and we had to choose Ancelotti, would he tr- trust Chuameni there or Rafa Marin? I think he'd probably just put Chuameni there. Yeah, he'd put Chuameni there, and I bet even if Chuameni, like, let's say for whatever reason, Chuameni had to play midfield because we had other injuries, or Chuameni couldn't play center back. I bet he'd even put Carvajal at center back before Rafa Marine and put Lucas Vasquez at right back. Yeah. Carvajal I wouldn't be surprised if we see Carvajal at right at center back for some game. Yeah, or Mendy. Um was did Carvajal play center back any time other than that Chelsea one? I don't think so, but because he played well there, I feel like Carlo will. Did he I feel like there was a bit of revisionist history with that because I think what I remember from um, Carvajal was that it was heroic, but it was shambolic too. Like it was a lot of like, oh shit, I don't know. I Probably, think... yeah. Probably I mean, that that thing, that extra time versus Chelsea was some of the most, you know, <laughs> sphincter clinching minutes I can remember <laughs> from as a mighty decent. That was tough to watch. Uh, yeah. So we're, I guess we're. In this I've seen now. a. I I've seen Laporte mention. He's obviously in the Saudi league now. I don't know. How are you going to afford that salary for six months? Yeah, I know. Exactly. Like, how is that going to work? So, and would they even, I don't know that the Saudi league, like people assume that they'll do loans or something, but I'm not sure that that will happen. Would you take Ramos back for six months? Oh, I would. Another unrealistic one, but. Yeah, I would. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I, I I lean towards more the veteran presence rental for six months than I would the youth guys because I think the youth like I I think Rafa Marin would just stop playing all season if he if he came in mid season yeah. that's my hunch unless you know you give him minutes here and there but he's definitely not playing any of the the games that you have to win and Ancelotti's putting out his best eleven. Um, Vallejo would have been good in a situation like this, but did you know Vallejo has only played two games this season? Lucas and I were looking at it. He's in. He's been he's injured. Been injured though, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Well, we'll. I. I think we'll find out maybe more about the potential names in the coming days. Lucas and I will record yeah. tomorrow too. We'll. We'll talk about it a little bit more then. Um, let's get back to the game because we barely talked about it. Yeah. Is this the worst Villarreal side you can remember playing against for? You know, for how long? A- against us specifically, they've had a poor season overall, but usually they they'll raise their game against us. But this was. I mean, this was just one way traffic. Yeah, I mean, you look at their midfield and their forward line, and it's not terrible, uh, but the back line is really rough. And I think when you look, when you take a closer glance at that midfield, even the forward line, like their best players or their like core players are just all guys that are aging. They're on their last legs. You got Gerard Moreno, I think he's 33, Danny Parejo around the same age, and Raul Albio, who's like, what, 38 or so around that. Like, those are their three central guys, and they're all kind of on their last legs. Um, and so, yeah, this this is a Villarreal team that struggled all season. I thought, I mean, obviously under Marcelino, you expect them to be um, well-drilled. We saw the typical Marcelino is always known for the 4-4-2, kind of that narrow 4-4-2. Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what they played. And so you expect a tough difficult game tactically for them to be disciplined um there was i liked this game because along with all the great goals along with the great individual performances like there was an edge to it like there was some nastiness and kind of some just i don't know it it just felt a little bit more heated which i liked like it was fun to watch 
Um, yeah. And in particular, I mean, from minute one, I couldn't help but watch Valverde and uh, Baena and just especially because they were basically Fede was marking him a lot of the times. And I, I was so impressed with Fede Valverde in this match because this could have been one where he lost his head pretty easily. It could have been one where he tried to get a good crunching tackle in early or something like that, but nope, he played composed. He was so disciplined. I mean, you saw him as basically a third center back a lot of the time. Um, and playing that false right back role that we've talked about. Um, he was just really good on the ball at cross field switches. Um, defensively, I just thought he was so locked in and, and ready for this game and wasn't going to let anything distract him, wasn't going to let, even if the Villarreal players or Alex Bayana tried to say anything to him again, I think he was just focused, lasered in. Um, and so I was really happy to see that. And I think some of his teammates, like obviously Lucas Vasquez, because that the, when Lucas stepped on Alex Bayan, I don't think that was like purposeful, but that wasn't the first skirmish those two had. Like if you remember in the earlier on, like ten minutes earlier on, they kind of battled it out, and uh, Alex Bayan took a swipe at Lucas's legs after he won it, and I felt like Lucas was kind of taking on the burden of like, hey, Betty, don't worry, I'll I'll uh I'll be the one to to rough him up a little bit. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't I. I, I think you pretty much nailed it on, on Fede. I think I don't know if it was like maybe they they spoke to him at, before the game. They're like, hey, we know this is on your mind. Just play your game, etc. Um, and uh, you know, I I I won't say it, and I didn't need to say it, but I think a lot of Madridistas remarked when you know Bayana went off injured. Um, a lot of them were I think were secretly fist pumping. I think that's I'm not gonna soup to that level i think that's terrible but uh i will say that i think there was it wasn't just by for me like this whole vrl team i don't know what happened what yeah. happened to them were they always like this i can't remember but no man like when it was 4-1 i like i was actually scared for bellingham like they were kicking the shit out of him they were trying to rile him up he was on a yellow the yellow was nonsensical if you ask me it was uh their um uh right back what's his name uh oh yeah. I I close so the lineups the tab. I'll I'll something I'll T. It was uh I don't know. I'll T I'll T something. You know what I mean? You you know who I'm talking about. Altimira. Altimira. I know I knew I got half of it right. Um <laughs> like he he the complete nonsensical dive when he was pulling Jude's shirt in the second half and he, he gets doesn't get hit in the head at all and he just throws himself to the ground. Jude gets booked. And then Danny Parejo was getting, you know, kind of unnecessarily yeah. feisty and aggressive. And they were down like four one at that point. I'm like, man, I'm I'm just glad Carlo took Jude off at that point. Cause I was getting kind of worried about it. But this Villarreal team was kind of like unlikable. And they they were unlikable last season too. And uh, not mad at it that we we beat them up four one. And it, again, it was kind of one way traffic. So I I don't know if you want to get into the nitty gritty of of the the details. Uh, I thought apart from a spell to start the second half where Villarreal were kind of forced to bring the line higher to start pressing, and they made us a little bit uncomfortable around the stretch where they also scored. I thought we were just so dominant in the, in the first half, right off in the first first minute. We pressed them. We won the ball quickly, and we counter pressed well. Everyone was working really hard. It was very cohesive, and we controlled possession. Transition defense was good. Vasquez was fantastic, both defensively and offensively. I don't know how he didn't end up with an assist tonight, but he deserved at least one. And Mendy on the other side was pretty good in the first half, uh, and of course he goes off injured at halftime, and you know it was just a really really solid performance. So. We can. Do you want to get into the goals we scored? Kind of break those down, or was there something else you want to you want to discuss before we do that? Um, I think the only other thing I want to discuss, and it's kind of like an overarching theme, is, and we touched on it earlier, just the pressing. Like it was, it was great. This is some of the best I've ever seen us press in like how many years? Um, and we did it with Cruz and Modric in the lineup, and I thought Modric was actually one of the best pressers out there today. Um, 
And it was just, yeah, it was fun to walk. We made Villarreal choke the ball up so many times in their final third, and that creates opportunities. And yeah, uh, by the way, when was, when if did when you play like this, playing Modric and Cruz together doesn't hurt you defensively. Yeah. Yep. It's kind of like when we played Isco Hamas, Modric and Cruz in Ancelotti's second year. Like when you yeah. when you play that high line and you're that compact as a team and you're pushing up, like you and you're suffocating the other team. There's there's no way for them to you've got it organized. There's no way for them to get out. Um so you can't get exploited in transition. Yeah. I think um but yeah, I just um we can we can go through the goals but I, I thought there were so many good standout performances you mentioned lucas he actually did get an assist by the way on that uh rodrigo goal he was the one that took oh that's right to oh did he, it counted as an assist yeah. i don't know i thought yeah, it just kind assist. of uh, uh it was a deflection that's why i wasn't sure yeah no he got it okay um but yeah yeah no just so many good performances i think luke i think for me though luka modric mvp I don't. It doesn't show up on who scored as an assist for him, but I don't know. Maybe on the yeah, official La Liga stats, so it score does. Okay. Um. So, yeah. I mean, I thought he had. I mean, Vasquez was great tonight. Just quickly. So, he had that brilliant, um, kind of dinked pass, and he sets up Rodrigo one v one on goal in the fifty sixth minute. He cuts in and dinks it with his left foot in the right half space. Um. He a couple times Parejo went over to that wing, uh, and Vasquez just blew by him. Defending was great too, and you know you, you mentioned the pressing. I mean, even the third goal we scored, which is sorry, the fourth goal, it's the Modric goal, which is just it's complete chaos in that like thirty seconds surrounding the goal because before it, um, we were pressing and I, I forget something happened right before the goal and then you kind of fast forward and we're pressing it's so cohesive that it actually the the straw that broke the camel's back and Villarreal actually gave up possession on that goal was Rudiger coming up yeah yeah and 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 pressing and helping us win the ball and then Rodrigo gets fouled in the box but of course you just play advantage and mortared scores that also came through a really good pressing sequence that fourth goal it the pressing was great yeah it was, it was. And I think um, on Lucas, the thing I love about him too is Cruz, every time he hits that diagonal pass him, Lucas brings it down perfectly. Like his first touch on those, um, he he just sets himself up either to take a guy on 1v1 or he takes an active first touch where he's beating his man because they gotten too close to him. And so then he knows, uh, okay, I'll just take an active first touch, a bigger first touch and, beat this guy for pace and so and as much as we've complained about the right back situation over the years like right now we're in, we're in kind of a unique spot that i didn't i don't think any of us would have expected in that carvajal is playing incredible and lucas when he plays like this like how many backup right backs are you going to find in the market like this like i he's up for renewal this year obviously and if it's just one more year, like at his age, I think it's just going to be the one year renewal. The, the way they're both playing, it's always a risk because they're thir- they're thirty two plus. But man, it's it's hard to find a better better option. Like Carvalho's playing is one of the best right backs in Europe, and then Lucas, you don't get you don't find a better backup right back than that. At least with performances like today. This yeah, this was much improved from that first game. He came back and he filled in for Carvalho. I don't remember which game that was. But the, he always the, takes like a few games. He takes like three or four games before he gets kind of back into well, it. This is what we were talking about with Modric too, right? Yeah, you and exactly, I were talking yep. about this last week, weren't we? Yep. yep. This is the theory confirmed where Modric says, "I need to play. I need to play." Yeah, so it I wasn't age. It better. was just his. He needed games. It wasn't gay. It wasn't. I was thought it was his age, but no. It's just Modric just needs games. To sit here and say that it's not his age at the age of thirty-eight. <laughs> It's just ludicrous to me that we're saying this. I mean, he looked great. I mean, the thing is now, like with his specific case, he does not need rest right now in this contextual situation. Yeah. In years past, I think it could have been different. But right now, he's yeah. barely playing. So, like, you yeah. you know, you can't really. I mean, this is the first game he also played the full full 90. I think this midweek. He, he played full 90. When? Midweek, didn't he play full mind against uh, Union Berlin? 
Yeah. Was that not the the one where he kicks the water bottle, or was that Betty's? No, that was Betty's. Okay, so you played that one too. Yeah, back to back nineties, I think. Okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I just wanted to know on the first goal. Everything was brilliant about it. And I think everyone agrees and knows that the loft and the arc and the accuracy of the motor to pass the Bellingham is brilliant. And the header is great. But something that I remember we would note so much with Rodrigo in that 2022 Champions League run was his diagonal runs off the ball into the box. And I just feel like it's such an underrated yet efficient play. You start from the wing and you just cut diagonally into the box. It's so hard to defend because you have the momentum. Defending the angle on the cross on that is difficult. The attacker has more momentum. And generally speaking, it somehow goes undetected. Rodrigo's great at it. Jude is great at it. Jude switches it beautifully to Vasquez, and then you see the movement. He just goes drifts, 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 diagonally, diagonally, and then he pops up and scores. So he, you know, this is just, I, I noted this because, again, going back to what I'm writing about him, he's averaging a goal-creating action per game, which essentially means you're going up like one goal ahead in every game with him on the field. If he's not scoring it, then... He's creating it. It's very rare that he doesn't score it himself. And I believe, I don't think there's been a situation this season where he's played two consecutive games without scoring. The most he's ever gone is one game without scoring. Yeah, I saw a Rudiger interview, I think it was, where he said, like, he can't believe what this guy is doing. And, like, he's just thinking about what... How is he going to cope when he, he hasn't even gone two games without scoring yet? So how will he cope when that happens? And he's so mature, though, that he thinks he'll be fine. Um, but that's the other thing, too. It's like Jude Bellingham's only 20 years old. I I myself always forget that. But just the insane fact. He's only two years older than Arda Guler and three years older than Endrick. Like, that's that's to put it in perspective. When Endrick's 20, he'll be 23. It, it's insane to me. Um, yeah, it's and literally so, the very, very beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but one thing that was actually noted on ESPN, Stevie Nichols said this, which I actually thought was like a really astute comment, was he said the reason why Bellingham is so effective with these runs is because he's he's always, when, he, when he's receiving the ball in the box, he's he's still running. He's still making his run. He's never stagnant. He's yeah. never like sitting in the box waiting for it. Yeah. It's he's moving as he's going, as he's going, then the ball hits him. And so it's so difficult to track from midfield. And if you're going to, if yeah. you're a midfielder passing him on to the defender, then the defender is kind of standing there static. And so it's hard to manipulate your body and make sure that you can catch him while he's got all this momentum going. And so um, I thought that was a really interesting comment and, and very true. Like you, you see it on that goal, like, and that's so often on all his goals, it's just, he's flying in late and it's so difficult to track and keep up with because he's so athletic and so strong and fast that, um, nine times out of 10, he will win that ball. As long as you get it to him, he'll, he'll be there and he'll score. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, obviously this is the thing, like the same Things we were saying about Cristiano, we're saying about Jude Bellingham now. And I think it was really hard for me to find a better example of a player in his first season at Real Madrid being so dominant in so many different areas of the field. Like, he's dominating everything. Defensively, offensively, playmaking, scoring, work ethic, pressing, He's posting career highs in aerial uh, dual percentage. One aerials, one. He's just incredible. He leads the league in through balls. He leads the league in blocked, blocked passes. He leads the league in goals. I mean, it's it's crazy. And like, I really had to like think: is is there a better example of a player in his first season having this multifaceted impact? And I was like, if if there was, 
it's like a short list that includes Alfredo Di Stefano, who just played every position. And it's not really Cristiano because Cristiano didn't do the defensive stuff that Jude is doing. Like, and he's not, he wasn't like dropping sometimes between our center backs to help escape pressure. Like, it's crazy. It's just, you know, you watch Jude in any random sequence, he could be anywhere on the field. Uh, so it's, it's a very unique, unique player we have on our hands here. Really, really special. Yeah. Even think of that moment. There was one moment at, I can't remember if it was in the first half or second half where he was on the right. He's like in the right half space on the top of the box. And he has two or three Villarreal defenders on him. Yet he still manages to find a little through ball. And both Modric, I think it's Modric Ibrahim, like they stopped making the run because they didn't think he was going to be able to get it through. And he did. Yeah. Um, and it was just like sometimes he's even so far advanced and like above belief that not even his teammates are sometimes on the same wave- wavelength as him. And yeah. he even think about like the games where he hasn't scored. He's had huge chances in them to score. Like he just barely missed. Like I think back to the beginning of the season, where there was that one where he missed like in the 90th minute, it was like just went over and he was on the goal line basically. And even the union Berlin game, that chance he had where he juggled it over one of the players and then hit the volley with his left foot. Like every game he has good opportunities, even if he doesn't score. Um, and so that's why we've been saying like, yeah, we think this can keep going. I mean, it may fall off a little bit, but he's still going to score goals. Well, um, he, and yeah, he, he had that also that you, you speaking of like incredible like plays and other, other players, maybe not being on the same wavelength or not expecting him to be able to pull off something. He had that one really brilliant, like it was like on the stroke of halftime, the 45th minute just this neat footwork in, in the box and then the pass to Rodrigo in the box who has that shot blocked, I think. Uh, that was another one that was like, wow, that was just such a such a great pass. Um, he just, he has the vision and the talent to execute certain things. Some players only have one or the other. <laughs> and uh, I mean, you look, you can't really execute without having the vision in the first place. But like the way he sees things and is able to hit it despite and I, I I posted one of the videos from the Union Berlin game where he passes it to Rodrigo in the box. You remember that one? And he's like dribbling like in stride. Like he's he's running with the ball and he hits that pass, yeah. which is even more yeah. difficult. <clears throat> um Brahim. Did you foresee this version of Brahim coming this season? I didn't. I did not because I mean I know you said it. We watched him quite a bit uh, at at Milan when we did the loan tracker. And his first year, he was he was playing similar to this first half of that season. And he even got called up to the Spain squad and yeah, was incredible before um, COVID. And before he yeah, got before COVID. COVID, and then it just after that, it just kind of he had some games where it was like, oh, Brahim's back, but it was never consistent. And even the Milan fans got really frustrated with him. Um, so I just I I've always liked him. But I just didn't have huge expectation. I never, never expected him to play like this. Um, but I think being he's part of a – I think this system complements him. I think being with these players complements him. And he's kind of – obviously, he didn't get the minutes he wanted to start the season. I think that gave him a little chip on his shoulder, and now he's proving himself. And um, that goal was unbelievable. Like, that was yeah, crazy. one of the best goals of the season. And I think – what I always notice with Brahim is like, if you go back and look, look at the replay on that goal, yes, the turn, like the turn is the best, one of the best parts of that goal. Yeah. But if you actually watch as he's dribbling up the field, he takes the first two dribbles with his right foot. Then the second two with his left foot back to his right foot. And when he chops and turns uh, against Ra- Raul Abiol, he's using both feet. And like, that's, he's just such a weapon to be able to have that, to be ambidextrous and to have both feet. Um, feel just feel as strong with your left foot as your right foot. Like I, I wish I could do that. He like that is such a secret weapon, and he, um, it's just when you see him do it, it, it's it's just it's lethal, and he's made the best of it. And I think this position works for him. I think he's fitting well into the team, and um, he's been much much better than I think anybody expected. I mean, I thought, I mean, I was like, okay, the the turn actually got me out of my seat. I was like, oh. I got up and I was like, okay, what's, and then carries the ball. And then 
when he cuts left, I was like, oh, okay, the play is over. I thought he was going to shoot and get and, and get it blocked. But then when he cut the second time, like, I mean, I, I at home was not expecting that. I thought he was going to shoot, let alone, you know, 80-year-old Raul Albiol. He has no chance. If I didn't know it was coming, he didn't know it was coming. And so the second cut is what makes it so special. Because I thought for sure he was going to just like panic shoot that with his left foot. But that's the thing. That, that if you can get that second cut in, that means you're very confident. Like he, he is playing with confidence. Um, shout out to Fran Garcia who got an assist for that for that play. But the other thing I'll note about Brahim is that working so hard defensively too, and yeah. that play in the first half where where I think it's off the back of a corner, we're conceding a counter attack. Mendy comes over to the right side yep. to stop an attack. Yeah, um, I and I don't remember which Villarreal player it was. It was Moreno, Gerard Moreno. It was Gerard Moreno. Okay. Even more yep. interesting. So, and then Brahim flies back and helps Mendy and, and he wins the ball. And I remember like years ago, and this goes back again to before he got COVID. I remember, you know, I was talking to Lucas and uh, I was telling him, like, I think. Brahim could be Brahim's like playing out of his mind right now. I think this is someone we can actually bring back and he has a future at Real Madrid. And then that kind of like energy and that excitement kind of wore off, you know, the last year or two at, at Milan, even like earlier on this season when Brahim was playing while well, you saw Milan fans come out and say like, Oh, you guys wait, he's going to disappoint you, but he's, he's getting better. And this is a huge asset to have in the squad. Someone like him right now, I mean, it's it's massive. Massive. Yeah, I mean, the, the obvious parallel is his impact versus Asensio because that's, in theory, the guy he replaced. And yeah, as much as Asensio was able to <laughs> score goals out of nothing, um, Brahim's... What I like about Brahim is he's just so actively involved and he's a great link-up player. He brings that spark he brings that dynamism like the turn like the little things like that he can he creates chaos through his ability and that's not something that asensio that that wasn't really part of asensio's game um and so from that perspective i i think it looks like we've leveled up and so we've added and that's at the end of the day like given all the injuries like that's what you say about this squad is it's much better depth than i think any of us realized and that this team and and, and everybody are, is is just playing better than than maybe we gave it, gave them credit for. Yeah, I think you know to get into the Asensio versus Brahim debate, if it even is one. I think to simplify it, is that Asensio is a better shooter and goal scorer, and Brahim is a better dribbler and uh, defensive player. I think Brahim I think brings in more. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I, I personally think Brahim, and I don't know if the metrics back this up, but I just think, in terms of build up play and link up and just being more involved in our final third with the rest of the team, I think he's uh, an upgrade over Asensio in that regard. Um, it feels like he's more visible. Um, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't. I mean, to be fair, Asensio's last year at Real Madrid was pretty good. I think, you know, yeah. we, I think yeah. we noted that and, to, you know, to be completely fair to him, that's not lost on us. Uh, but I think I, I do think Brahim is just more reliable from an effort and defense perspective. And also it's just a better dribbler, line breaker kind of kind of player. Uh, OK. And then what else? Rodrigo, um, did Rod- they didn't give. Did they give Rodrigo the assist on Modric? Modric's goal. Uh I'd be shocked. He, I mean, he just got clocked. I mean, I don't even. Sofa think scores. He... Oh, you, you don't think he's getting the assist? I thought he like toe poked it over to him or no? Before he got clocked. It's not showing up on who scored. I mean, from what I remember okay. of that, he just gets fouled. Basically, I don't know if he oh, intentionally. Okay. I thought um, he toe poked it before he got fouled, but maybe not. Um, but yeah, I'm just happy he's kept his his streak going. Um, I think it's, I got to go back and look. I think it's seven, 15, 15 or 17 goals and assists in 11. Oh, 15 goals and assists in his last 11 matches. Wow. That's quite a return. Pretty incredible. Um, yeah. And I mean, he had 
I think I saw Opto Jose put out the stat that he had one goal in his first 12 games, and now he has um, nine goals in his last seven, I think it is, or or somewhere around that. Um, so just he's, he's turned it around. Um, glad it's continued. He's up to 10 goals on the season, and that's kind of what we expect for him. And, you know, again, kind of talking tactical tweaks, like he's not really playing as a striker anymore. Um, he's, he's, you look at his heat map, you look at what his starting positions. Um, yes, he's still central, but he's, he's more of a left winger without Vinicius, obviously, um, than he has been all season getting, oh, he's, I think he's just been given more freedom by Ancelotti. I think Ancelotti, Maybe they had a conversation and he said, Hey, I just feel like a little bit too confined to these spaces. And uh now he's able to to kind of branch out further and come attack from that that left position. Do you feel like there's a bit of like elephant in the room situation right now with Vinicius not playing right now and Rodrigo's looking amazing? The team is scoring freely and flowly. Like how how do you Freely and flowly. That's not even well, if, freely. If you remember, Rodrigo's streak kind of started before Vinicius got injured. Like that. Remember the yeah. Valencia game? Valencia, um, Braga. Yeah. So I I don't know that it's I don't know that it's all that. I think I I can't wait to see Vinicius, Jude, and Rodrigo together. Like I think they're gonna yeah. click really oh, well. Oh, me too. I um, I'm I'm just I so what do you uh, I'm just curious. Like, do you just go back to? The nominal Vinicius goes left wing and Rodrigo drifts more centrally, kind of thing. Hedges left a I little think so. bit. Yeah. Well, I think I think Rodrigo in what we saw in those games was basically we'd let a midfielder be the focal point, whether it would kind of rotate, whether it be Fede, Jude, or somebody else as like kind of the central striker. And both Rodrigo and Vinny were just going wider and wider rather than staying central. So I think that's what made. End well, up happening. you see a lot of like, oh man, like this is Rodrigo's best position when Vinicius comes back, you know, it's, it's, then he's going to take the limelight from Rodrigo again. And just to remind people, Vinicius and Rodrigo together last season were really yeah. great. And going back to midway through last season, what changed our performances for the better, especially in the Champions League, we made that run, was, was when Carlo introduced Rodrigo into the starting lineup to help Vinicius offensively because Benzema yeah. was missing. You know, he doesn't obviously have a Jude Bellingham last season to link up with. So Rodrigo, and Rodrigo was playing quite central last season too. Like he was not stick, stuck to the right wing. Uh, So I think that's probably just what it's going to go. And, and I go back to this, like I, I've, I've, I've said this so many times and I'll die on this hill. I think people who disagree are just wrong on this. The whole Vinny and Rodrigo being in and out of form thing had less to do with the formation and their positioning than they made it out to be. It I was, a, it was a more of a confidence, body language and momentum rhythm thing. And they just picked it up um, as the season wore on. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else from the game specifically? Um, I think we talked about Luka Modric, just five key passes in this one. Um, the assist, obviously, to to Jude Bellingham to open it up. I just thought he did a little bit of everything in this, and it just it it was just fun to watch him when he's in this full flight mode, and just it just vintage Luka Modric, and I think. It's fun to see him be the magician, be that guy again. He saw how happy he was after the game. Um, so I think I just, I again, want to point him out just because it was such a superb performance. Modric was awesome. Even hit the bar earlier on. Everything oh, yeah, was, that's right. Yeah, yeah, his creative play was was fantastic. Didn't have to do that much defensively because the team was pressing and counter-pressing efficiently. Uh, XG tonight. Two point uh three three via real point five six. The field tilt was eighty two percent in our favor. Pure dominance. Yeah. Eight passes per defensive action. Um this is just, you know, the standard I go through the mark stat spot 
go Twitter account, the thread he posts. Mm-hmm. Uh, he always has this analytical kind of AI thing, like kind of puts out the best performers at the end of the thread. Tony Cruz, uh, just his ball progression, phenomenal, as it always is. Just his passing, long range distribution, everything, fantastic. Uh, oh, you mentioned one quick thing. You mentioned Fran Garcia earlier. Yeah, I thought this was his best best game all season. Obviously, really, only four. Yeah, I thought, I thought for once he didn't look nervy. Like he was playing aggressive. I actually liked. Like I think he got a yellow card, or almost got a yellow card. But like I prefer him to play like that, where he's just ultra aggressive, showing off how quick he is. Like didn't look nervy. Was assured in every pass he did. It was. I just felt like something switched for him. Um, and that, that was really encouraging for me because I was starting to get worried that he might have the ER Mende or Odriozola type syndrome where mm. you go to a bigger club and it just for whatever reason you have the talent, but you just can't you can't click it on. It's just too much. And uh today I was I was really happy to see the way he played when he came on. I actually um really liked his performance against Union Berlin. I I thought I he was, thought he looked nervy there. I there know, was a I couple of nervy moments but, in that Union Berlin yeah. game early on, but I think overall he looked great. I mean, offensively especially, I think he did he did so many good things. Maybe that just kind of built on his confidence, and you can just eventually yeah. stack it, and it it gets better and better for him. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah he's looked good though the last couple of games to me. Also, uh, understat has our xG at three point two two, which is way more than what Mark Stat spot mm-hmm. had. I don't know why. Um, and the, uh, the passes per defensive action are three, three passes fewer than our season average. So we usually allow 11.7 right. passes per defensive action. Today, we only allowed eight, which means we were more aggressive than usual today with our press. Because if you look at our press, it's actually below average in La Liga in terms of aggressiveness. It's not normal that we press with this much intensity. So this was actually a bit of a deviation. So wait, you said we normally allow seven, and how much did we allow today? No, we we normally allow eleven point seven. Oh, eleven. Today we allow oh. eight. Okay. Three less than usual. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's material yeah. though. Like that's yeah. like a over thirty percent. Yeah, I mean, and, and I mean, like we're like in the bottom third of La Liga in terms of how aggressive we are with their press. Like we just don't really do it. We kind of go into a mid block and and let them play out of the back. Do you think usually. we'll see more of this, or do you think this may this is a, it's so unpredictable, a man? Remember yeah. last year we saw it yeah. at the, in the classical at the Bernabeu, the one we lost one nil. It was like yeah. crazy aggressive, and then it just comes and goes. I don't know necessarily what they base it on. I do think probably today it also had a little to do with Villarreal playing deep. So yeah, it was that back line. They felt yeah. like they could get advantage, take advantage of that back line. Yeah. So, like, you know, it's it's also contextual upon the opponent as well. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we missed anything from Carlos' post-game quotes. We got the important stuff, I think. Um, he did mention Goulart and uh, a couple others are back. Oh, the other thing... um. I did want to mention like the progression of Lunin's status in Ancelotti's oh, yeah. eyes. Yeah. So before the uh, the trade, the kind of like the trademark response was like, well, Lunin's playing good, but that doesn't change anything. And Kepa is our starting goalkeeper. Today, he said we have two starting goalkeepers. We have one called Lunin and one called Kepa. So that's like, wow, the hierarchy has kind of shifted um, I don't know what he does in the next really big game, but um, the numbers don't lie. Real deal pods and Sid and Mehedi were putting it out too. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I mean, his his numbers are better. He has a great save percentage too. I think he's, you know, it's one of the best, if not the best in the league right now. I think it's another too. It's like Ancelotti stuck his neck out to get Kepa because uh, he wanted Kepa. Yeah. And... So for him to play Lunin in front of Keppa after kind of requesting it from the board, I think that's huge. Like that is huge. And that's tells you how well Lunin has played, like for him to do that and for him to kind of be like, ah, you know what? 
I, I know I, I pushed for this guy, but Luton's playing so well, I've got to start him. Um, and so I think that's, um, that's a credit to Lunin. Like you, that's, that's what you do. Like if you're, if you want to start, you have to play so well that the coach has no choice, but to, but to play. Um, I think we're going to slowly wrap it up here. Matt and I both have sick children at our, in our houses right now. And, uh, <laughs> we both need to be, be dads. Luckily, I think my, my son is sleeping right now. He's sleeping through it. I just heard some coughs in the, in the Wilty household. And I, I have to be <laughs> respectful and mindful of that. But I think we I think we got the important stuff um, done uh, and discussed. And if there's leftover stuff, you know, we got a lot of pods. So we're going to we'll tackle some more. The Alaba stuff, the Champions League draws tomorrow. Uh, that's another big talking point. We're going to get to see uh, who we face. Matt, uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to do some patron shout outs really quick. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll wrap it up. So I wanted to let everyone know. Uh, me and Lucas will do a podcast either tomorrow or Tuesday. We'll recap the Champions League draw, the Alaba situation, potential signings. And then uh, the rest of the shows for the week are over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. We're doing a weekly live Zoom call. That'll go up on Wednesday. You can join the call. If you ever wanted to talk to us, quote unquote, in person, in this case, virtually face to face, this is the best way to do it have conversations with us. I especially encourage you to join if you ever disagreed with us about anything, especially if you disagree with us vehemently. And I would rather you guys come to the live call, unmute your microphone, put your camera on and have a conversation with us instead of typing away angrily on the keyboard and saying something maybe you wouldn't have said otherwise uh, if you saw us in person. So weekly live call Patreon for patrons and then also the weekly mailbag for patrons and generally, if there's any midweek postgame show, Champions League, Copa del Rey, La Liga, that's only for patrons. So again, go to patreon.com slash managing Madrid. And if Patreon doesn't work in your country, you can click on the YouTube memberships tab on my YouTube channel and you can get the content there as well. All right. So if you pledge $10 or more per month, you get a specific shout out on the podcast. You also get guaranteed responses to your questions and access to all of our content, including our entire back catalog. So Shout out to these $10 plus patrons per month. Daniel Smith, Fabian Moreno, KT, Primo, Ramtin Magrur, Varun, Bella Chow, Adam Dorsey, Adar Zalukovic, Azaz Hussein, Alex Slyberg, Alexandria McCaskill, Ananya Kumar, Andres Silvestre, Anthony Tharp, Armando L, Armand Gashi, Armash, Arnab Mukherjee, Brandon Stevens, Brandon Powers, Carlos Fuentes, Christian Acosta, Connor McMorrow, Daniel Williams, Deadpool Lover, Eloy Enriquez, S.A. Davisito, Frederick Sundros, Frederick Rantakiro, Gary Kohut, Graham Gerard, Howard Moore, Ian Marley, Jacob P., Jason Fitz, John Fernandez, Jose Cruz, Jose Osorio, Kevin Rivera, Halfan Alkabi, Kunal Tilakar, Leon Stavronakis, Logan Stahl, Magnus Lext, Martin Ridman, Matthew Atkins, Marin Myrtle, Michael Zinberg, MJ Diego, Naveen Babu, Ramesh Babu, and Endaba Halambangana, Nelson Masariego, Nick Ribeiro, Nicholas Muller, Oscar Barrera, Patrick Diafari, Paulo Fierro, Peter P, Phoenix, Rishi D, Sai Mohan, Sasi Kumar, Sam Razi, Samuli Justin, Santos Solorzano, Sergio Arispe, Sheikh Atiri, Somanchu Singh, Sujai Wani, Sushank Tamala, Tahmid Kalam, Tobias Royal Botcher, Wamik Jamal, Wasim Haddad, Will Sousa, Willie Reed, and Brandon Alvarez. Absolute legends. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, buddy. Great chatting. Hope everything Thanks, goes Ken. well and everyone recovers in your house. And we will chat soon. Peace out.